a broker, an underwriter, and an actuator are driving in a car. And of course, the broker has her foot on the gas. She wants to go, right? The underwriter has his foot on the brake. He's slowing things down, making sure everything's reasonable. And the actuary, the actuary is looking out the back window and telling everybody where to go. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of uh, Colleen DeMerchant and Nyack, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Nyack Leadership Forum and our 65th anniversary celebration at the innovative and sometimes controversial but never boring Art Gallery of Ontario. So I hope you all enjoy your stay here. Uh, just a couple of uh, points of interest to get through. So bathrooms are across the hall there for anybody who needs to go. Uh, we'll do a short break after our first speaker just to give everybody a chance to um, get refreshments and go to the bathroom if they need to. But if you have to go, don't hesitate. Uh, fire exits, so you can head straight out the hall there, just head for the light, <laughs> or you can follow me, because I might be the first guy out in a fire alarm, <laughs> all right? Um, we've got an interesting program lined up for everyone today. We're looking to the future, informed by the past, of course, and uh, all of our speakers today are people of science. Diverse interests, both in how they spend their leisure time and in the books that they've managed to read there over the past little while. And uh, this common science background, seasoned by thy diverse interests, we hope will provide the forum members with fresh insights into the ever-evolving nuclear insurance business landscape. We'll start off with a short history of nuclear insurance from a legal standpoint, before moving into McMaster University's contributions to the Canadian nuclear footprint over the last couple of decades. And finally, we'll look forward to the new world of SMRs with uh, our guest from OPG, Dave Tyndall there. Before we get into the program proper, I do have um, one request actually. So um, when we first talked to our speakers, we sent out a questionnaire asking them, if you had to give up coffee for a day or your cell phone for a day, what would it be? And of course the answer came back, cell phones. That was unanimous. So um, I can't give them a full day with no cell phones, but we as a group can give them two hours with no cell phones. So I'm asking everybody to Shut down your cell phones. I understand everybody's got important business. If you have to leave, if you have to talk on the cell phone or text any more than one word, <laughs> I'm asking everybody to uh, go to the public areas there where there's couches and sofas set up and you can do some work there. Um, we'll welcome you back when you come back and you finish your business there. But uh, please try and keep the cell phones away for now. Uh, the other thing I'll ask is we have a pretty full program um, this afternoon. So I'll ask everyone to hold questions to the end of the presentation. So make your notes and uh, just wait till the end of the presentation and uh, we'll open the floor to questions for everybody and anything. So that should satisfy, uh, that should satisfy everyone's requirements there. All right, uh, I'll move right into introducing our first speaker then. Um, let me just see if I've got a slide here for, all right, so there's all our speakers. And I do have a slide for Ibenna. So if you hadn't already guessed from her name, our first guest is a citizen of both France and Chile. As a young girl, Jimena had originally wanted to pursue a career in archaeology, history, art, and architecture. However, she quickly came to appreciate she could have a much greater impact by including the sciences in her career goals. And I think we're all thankful that she did. So here she is today. She's well-schooled in Churchill, Orwell, John Wick, and in her former life, an elite member of the whole in one club. You'll have a chance to question Jimena about all that in the social hour. Today, Jimena is a member of the Paris Bar and holds a DEA in international law from the University of Paris. She began her career at Veolia Water Technologies and has held positions at EDF as well as the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, first as a senior legal advisor before moving into the position of head of the Office of Legal Counsel before moving on to her current position at White & Case LLP. She's been called on extensively to put her expertise to work serving the International Atomic Energy Association in Vienna, the European Commission and the World Nuclear Association. I'd ask everyone to please extend a warm Canadian welcome to Imena Vasquez Mignon. Now I know why they ask the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. We just call up the presentation. Yeah. Thank you. You don't need to what I'm saying about uh, Dave Tucker and Dave Tucker. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a, my pleasure and my and a real honor to have been invited here to celebrate the 65th anniversary of uh, NIAC uh, in this beautiful 
place, uh, this museum. So I would like to congratulate, first of all, uh, the NIAC team, past and present, for all these 65 years uh, of great work. I have, been provide, I, mean, I have been asked, in fact, to provide you with an overview of the international and Canadian nuclear liability developments through history, with a focus on the role of the insurance pools playing in this major industrial uh, adventure that started 70 years ago. One thing is certain, it's that nuclear power could not have been developed without the support and the establishment of the nuclear liability regime and, of course, the nuclear insurance. I mean, that is a reality. So let's begin with the International Legal Framework. But first of all, I'm going to start a little bit with history, and I want us to try to imagine how the world was in the early 50s when everything started. So we were getting out of World War II, and the world, in fact, had discovered with horror the dramatic consequences of the atomic bomb. We have, unfortunately, to have that in mind because it has until now given uh, the anti-nuclear a lot of discussion about what nuclear can bring. But we had the famous speech of the atoms for peace. So in December 1953, President Eisenhower delivered his famous speech, Atoms for Peace, before the United Nations General Assembly, during which he pleaded for the pursuit of nuclear power and the establishment of the International Atomic Energy Agency to devise methods whereby this fissionable material will be allocated to serve the peaceful pursuits of mankind. He vowed that against the dark background of the atomic bomb, the United States pledged before the UN General Assembly, and therefore before the world, its determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind to finding the way by which the miraculous inve inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. That was the beginning of a new technological frontier, if we want to use the terms of another US president. So nuclear reactors already existed in the 1940s. Canada had the NRX reactor at Chuck River Laboratories, which began operation in 1947. But the initial success for civilian power generation came in 1954. On the 9th of May of 1954, the five megawatt graphite moderated light water cooled, this is for the engineers, uh, light water cooled enriched uranium reactor at Obninsk in the former USSR reached criticality. And at 5.30 PM on the 26th of June, 1954, it was connected to the Mosenegro Great. So this was the beginning of everything. However, the industry feared the consequences that a nuclear accident could have and was reluctant to enter into this business and to develop this new type of energy. So in 1957, a report entitled that again for the engineers, theoretical possibilities and consequences of major accidents in large nuclear power plants, also known as the Brookhaven Report, was published by the US Atomic Energy Commission. The statistics-based report estimated the possible effects of a maximum credible reactor accident and considered that it could cause up to 3,400 deaths, 43,000 injuries, and property damage of 7 billion 1957, of course, US dollars. As you can imagine, it caused great public concern, and the American Atomic Industrial Forum decided to assess the legal consequences of such a major accident with the assistance of the Columbia University. Such report was then used as a reference when drafting the Price-Anderson Act, which was enacted that same year, 1957, by the US Congress. So this is a historical moment worldwide for the nuclear industry, because this was the first nuclear liability law ever adopted. And so here it's the legal adventure that began. The purpose was to encourage the development of the nuclear industry and to ensure prompt and adequate compensation in the event of a nuclear incident. But what is interesting is that since the beginning, the nuclear industry was considering the potential consequences of an accident in case of export 
to another country, and taking into consideration that a nuclear power plant would require the support of suppliers from different countries. So in November 1957, the Atomic Industrial Forum requested the Harvard University to prepare, and here I would like to quote the 1954, no, sorry, 1959 foreword of the Harvard report, a study of the international aspects of the problem of financial protection of the public and atomic industry against nuclear risk. In short, the problem of nuclear liability, the prospect of participation by business enterprises of several countries in the design, construction, and operation of nuclear facilities, immediately raises the problem of what the legal and financial implications might be of a serious accident of facilities developed through such multinational effort. The allocation of fault and the distribution of liability among participants from several countries is a problem of practical immediacy and evident complexity. The problem is further complicated by the possibility that a nuclear accident will spread its effects beyond the borders of a single country, a possibility that cannot be completely discounted in the case of nuclear facilities located among the crowded nations of Europe. And an unquote. Thank you. From the beginning, everything was said in this famous Harvard report. So the nuclear sector has always been a global industry. This Harvard report was prepared with the contributions of the nuclear industry, but of course, and most of all, of the insurance industry. So they were very present and active in defining how the risk should be assessed and addressed from an insurance perspective. As stated in the report, the availability of insurance is generally a prerequisite to the participation of private enterprise in nuclear development. As you know, the private sector is pretty risk averse, and so what they want to know is whether they can cover themselves with insurance that there is a way of mitigating that. The director and assistant director of the Harvard Group were invited as observers to the discussions that led to the adoption of the first nuclear liability convention, the 1960 Paris Convention on Third Party Liability in the Field of Nuclear Energy. Therefore, this Harvard report had an important effect on the drafting of this convention and the other to follow, as you know. So it is for us lawyers sort of a Bible. I'm not going to get here into the details of what the nuclear bi liability principles are, as most of you are very familiar with that, but I just want to say that after the Price Anderson Act was adopted, so you had the Paris Convention that was adopted so in 1960. But at that time, because one of the main issues and people are saying is, oh, why do we have so many nuclear liability conventions? And this is one of the reasons why. So it was, at the time, the Paris Convention only opened to OECD member countries. And therefore the IAEA wanted to adopt a similar convention with the same principles in the 1963, which is now what we know, the Vienna Convention on Civil Liability for Nuclear Damage, that then is open to all countries of the UN. In the 1960s, we then had these two nuclear liability regimes in place, which in fact very similar, and which purpose was to harmonize national legislations relating to nuclear liability and address the consequences of transboundary damage. So they provided for the basic nuclear liability principles that we know today. So, Mark, I stole that from your website, I'm sorry. But I put the source. So it is interesting to note that after having examined in detail the different options to ensure enough insurance capacity at reasonable commercial terms for the nuclear operators, the Harvard report concludes that, and here I quote, there exists a real need for a fear flow of insurance capacity among national pools. An ideal, though perhaps premature solution, would be to create a worldwide insurance pooling arrangement in which national pools could participate. Such a worldwide pool could either write direct insurance or reinsurance national pools for part of the coverage extended to installations located within their respective countries. Just as domestic pools increase the policy coverage presently available, 
an international pool would further increase the capacity of the insurance industry on a worldwide basis, unquote. So as you can see, the Harvard scholars had already foreseen the intricate system that we have to today with regard to the nuclear insurance pools. So these pools were established in the 1950s. And the Nuclear Insurance Association of, in Canada, of course, in 1958, as we can calculate. So establishing these pools for a specific industry was a first and a real challenge. Extremely large amounts of insurance were required. The first nuclear power plants were being constructed, so they didn't know exactly what they're going to cover. Could not have, there was no track record in order to do the probabilistic studies. So it was a real adventure. But the system allowed to spread the risk through the insurance industry at the national level, but also the international level through the reinsurance system. Great adventure, but then we had Chernobyl. I don't want to mention the Three Mile Island because it, it didn't have any uh, side effects, so it didn't have an impact, let's say, there on the nuclear liability, maybe on the insurance part, because then uh, it was required to have insurance uh, for the property damage, but nothing to do with nuclear liability. But we had a Chernobyl accident. And so the experts realized in a more concrete manner the transboundary effects of a nuclear accident and its impact on the human body, the environment, and the economy. So even though the nuclear liability principles did not apply to these accidents because then USSR was not a party to any of the conventions and didn't have any nuclear liability law, they wanted to start reviewing the convention based on those consequences. So, one of the first issues that the international community wanted to address was to try to tackle what Chernobyl had caused as uh, consequences. So, we now have the Paris and the Vienna countries. One of the questions that raised after Chernobyl was what is, would have, have happened if an accident occurring in a Vienna country would have had damage in a Paris country. And so then we adopted the joint protocol that linked these two conventions that provides for, for the very simple principle that if an accident occurs in a Vienna convention country with effects on a Paris convention country and that both countries have joined the joint protocol, then the Paris convention victims would be treated as if they were national, let's say, of a Vienna Convention country. It's a very simple principle, so that also helped that I think, from a lawyer's perspective, this was a very, very speedy way of adopting an international instrument, because it was adopted in 1988 and it entered into force in April 1992. Never seen before <laughs> in international treaties that an instrument could be adopted so quickly. But then they started looking into what could be amended in the conventions in order to improve it. And so we had the 2004, well, first they started by reviewing the Vienna Convention, so we should first talk about 1997 protocol to amend, to revise, to amend the Vienna Convention. And we had the 2004 protocol to amend the Paris Convention. Now, what is interesting here is that the 2004 protocol because maybe some of you are not super familiar with this convention, which are mostly uh, European and Asian. I mean, it's not in the in North America part of the world. What is interesting to note is that if the 2004 protocol to amend the Paris Convention was consolidated once it entered into force on the 1st of January 2022, and that now we just talk about the Paris Convention as revised, it's, that's not the case for the Vienna Convention. The 1963 Vienna Convention, the 1997 Protocol, have been conceived as two distinct treaties independent of each other that coexist side by side. And this is due to a legal technicality. Sorry, lawyers again. The 1963 Vienna Convention does not provide for a specific procedure to adopt an instrument to amend it, so another separate treaty needed to be adopted, which means that a country today can either ratify the original Vienna or the revised Vienna or both. So it complicates things. We, can, we were not able to get rid 
of the original Vienna Convention, we provided for a nuclear liability regime, which is not as modern, let's say, as the revised Paris and the protocol. But then another convention appeared, the CSC, and Canada is a party to that. Uh, so the CSC was adopted uh, for different reasons. Um, I don't want to get into the whole details, and I don't want to get also into the fact that the Paris Convention comes with an international fund, and so does the CSC. But let's say that now we're living in a world where we have four nuclear liability regimes that apply. The Paris, the old Vienna, the revised Vienna, and the CSC. Welcome to a lawyer's headache. Uh, and also in other insurers, especially with regard to transportation. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so yes, it doesn't make life easy, but well, it is a very interesting thing uh, to address. So what did, I mean, I'm not going to get into the whole details of what this modernized regime, post-Chernobyl regime brought, but I would just say that what did the amendments do? That extended geographical scope so that in order to protect the maximum victims possible. Well, there are some risks of overlap now with regard to transport sometimes. We discuss about that, but let's say that here the idea is to protect the most victims. It extended the type of damage to be compensated. The fact is that the or as provided in the original Vienna, you have damage to or loss of life, damage to or loss of property. Afterwards, up to the judge to decide what they would put into that. How do we interpret that? So the revised conventions, the modern conventions, what they decided is that they wanted to provide at least some specific types of damage that have to be covered in order to harmonize the approaches of the judges. However, there is still some space to interpretation because in part environment, it will be up to the judge to decide what is in part environment. But this is a way to try to approach harmonization as much as possible. And here's the one insurance covers the risk. I mean, you know that nuclear liability regime, it's an exceptional regime. Usually it should be tort law that should be applied. So each time that we have our radio protection experts that tell us, oh, it's okay. I mean, you can sort of uh, limit the effects or we have the insurance telling us, it's okay, we can cover with another type of insurance, it's out of the nuclear liability regime because it has to remain an exception to the normal tort law. So, for example, nuclear liability for damage is, so the, the operator's liability is excluded in case of armed conflict, hostilities, civil war and insurrection, but not in case of terrorism because it's covered. It also, before, I mean, still under the CSC, uh, the operator can, uh, liability can be ex excluded in case of grave natural disaster of exceptional character. Well, that's not the case anymore under the Paris and the revised Vienna. That has been taken out because insurance is available at least for those countries. So the other thing is the extension of the prescription period. So we saw the effects on the human body. So there was ex an extension of the prescription period for bodily injury to 30 years. This has raised a lot of discussion with the insurance because it's true how can you be sure that after 10 years, the cancer that can be developed is really, has been already been caused by the nuclear accident. So one of the things also that you have to have in mind is that this prescription period it's a clock that starts ticking. And so with regard to claims handling also, it's a big issue. People were going to file for compensation, but then it has to be done quickly because they only have as much time to be able to claim for compensation. The other important thing, of course, has been the liability amounts. So the original conventions, they provided for a cap they didn't say that the countries could go beyond that cap. It was really capped to protect the industry that was just starting. But then afterwards, in fact, all conventions now provide for a minimum that you have here, 
and some countries are even provided for unlimited liability, like Japan, like Germany. But of course, with regard to insurance, there is always an amount that is provided in the law uh, that requires the operators you know, to get insurance or other financial security for that type of amount. The Canadian nuclear liability regime. So this was interesting. Get a little glimpse of the history of the Canadian law because NIAC was established in 1958, but the Canadian Nuclear Liability Act was adopted in 1970 and came into force on the 11th of October 1976. So it was modeled on the provision of the original Vienna Convention and it, it provided some interesting provisions that I'm setting here. For example, the operator was not liable for damage outside of Canada at that time, except in case of reciprocal arrangement with their neighbors, United States. Of course, I mean, Canada and US it, are in a geographical space which is not the same as, for example, in Europe where there are so many countries, one next to another. The operator has a duty to ensure that no personal injury or property damage was caused by nuclear material within its control. Its liability was absolute only in the event of a breach of this duty. So it was a different way of saying how the operator was solely, uh, ex uh, exclusively and absolutely liable. Two or more operators may be jointly and severally liable, but otherwise the operator's liability was exclusive. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission decides on the level of basic insurance for each nuclear installation. And in case of low risk installation, so the government had to take uh, the difference uh, between the lower amount and the normal amount. Now, after Chernobyl, the wave of fear with regard to nuclear power arrived also in Canada. And in 1987, a legal action was taken against the Canadian federal government challenging the constitutionality of the Canadian Nuclear Liability Act. The action was initiated by the Canadian Environment Group, a number of concerned citizens, and the city of Toronto. Sorry. So the case raised a number of issues relating to, among other things, jurisdiction over nuclear energy in a federal political system, the effectiveness of tort liability versus administrative systems in providing compensation, the concept of tort liability as a deterrent to unsafe activities and the appropriate limitation liability. The plaintiffs considered that the NLA was encouraging an inherent risky technology contravening the right to life, liberty, and security. The defendant argued that the Atomic Energy Control Act and the Nuclear Liability Act provided the fair regulatory framework to prevent and minimize nuclear accidents while addressing the consequences should it occur. So they were, they were in fact challenging the channeling of the liability, the fact that the limitation of liability caused in fact more insecurity, as you can imagine, because the uh, NLA was still there. Uh, this action was completely dismissed. But afterwards, Canada tried to, on several occasions, to upgrade, let's say, uh, their nuclear liability legislation. It was difficult. There was this famous uh, Bill C-5 that was introduced in 2007 that finally didn't get there for political reasons. I mean, I've been trying to help the Paris Convention countries to ratify the 2004 protocols that only entered into force in 2022, so I know how political reasons can also interact while you're trying to improve a nuclear liability regime. But then finally, the current legislation was adopted in 2017, the Nuclear Liability and Compensation Act, Nuclear Liability and Compensation Rules, and also the ratification of the CSC. This reflects the modern conventions, the absolute and exclusive liability of the operator, the fact that the operator has no right of recourse against any person other than an individual, intentionally caused the nuclear incident by an act or omission. And one interesting thing, because this is with regard to what happened in Fukushima, because as this came after Fukushima, there were also some lessons learned, the psychological trauma needed to result from bodily injury, because in Fukushima, a lot of Psychological trauma was, in fact, uh, compensated. And I'm going to try to go quickly because I know that my time is over, almost over. Um, so we had three phases, let's say, of the evolution of uh, the nuclear liability regime. The beginning, Chernobyl, modernization, post-Fukushima. 
So I think that you all are familiar with what happened in Fukushima. I would just like to stress the fact that there were no direct casualties and that the, the victims are really the evacuees and the businesses. One of the things that we can learn from Fukushima is that they had to deal with three million applications. So you have to be ready in case of an accident uh, in order to be able to handle so many applications. Of three million was, you know, during the whole spread of the years, but still you have quite a number that arrived to you uh, from the beginning, so you need to be ready. They hired, like, there were like 12,500 persons dealing with claims management at one point uh, in Japan. It's also, I guess, what I mentioned with prescription period, a race against time. Uh, the Japanese government decided at one moment that the prescription period will be extended in order to allow, in fact, the victims to get more compensation. So the three years period during which they needed to claim for compensation was extended to 10 years in Japan. And also you have the amount. So they paid almost uh, $83 billion. But again, that's also with regard to the definition of nuclear damage that might not be the same in all the countries. As I mentioned, in Canada, for example, uh, mental anguish has to be accompanying, I mean, has to come with a bodily injury. In Japan, that was not the case. It was just mental anguish. So there was a lot there. So one of the lessons learned is treaty relations, treaty relations, treaty relations, meaning. <laughs> uh, the countries, whether having nuclear power or not, should adopt, I mean, should ratify one of the conventions. You have some countries, and especially the modern one, just, just forget about the old Vienna. But you have some countries like Romania and the UAE, for example, that have ratified the revised Vienna Convention, the Joint Protocol, and the CSC. So they have treaty relations with absolutely every country that have ratified a convention. And so this also helps with regard to suppliers, with regard to insurance, with regard to everybody, because they have the same treatment. And there is still work to do. I mean, you have some countries that are not parties to the conventions. Uh, two big exporters like China and Korea are not yet part of that. So what are the challenges today? Continue improving the nuclear liability. As I said, after Fukushima, the focus was on claims handling, uh, how to deal with that. We had a great uh, workshop uh, in 2019 to discuss uh, about that. And now, especially that we have making, nuclear is making a comeback. Now, I would like to quote somebody. Climate change is a term on everyone's mind, and there is a great deal of debate on how to reduce emissions. It is clear nuclear energy must be part of this solution. This was written in 2008 in an article entitled Nuclear Insurance Proliferation, and written by Colleen the Merchant, assistant manager, which will have listened to you then. <laughs> That was 2008, and you were so right, Colleen. <laughs> so now the next challenge, the next frontier are SMRs that everybody's talking about. I know that we're going to have a specific talk about this. Uh, you have 80 different styles of SMRs, wide range, big, small, for different type of uses. So the question will be, what nuclear liability amounts would be applicable to each of them. The thing is that SMRs is such a wide variety of different technologies that, in fact, we shouldn't be talking about SMRs in general because people is like, what do you do with the SMRs? I mean, which one? So <laughs> there are going to be a discussion per type of SMRs about uh, the amounts applicable because you can have a lower amount. But you have other considerations, which who is going to be the operator? I mean, I've been discussing with this type of SMRs that are going to provide heat or electricity to an industrial company. So sometimes now you have a lot of startups, you know, that are wants to sell those, so they don't have experience uh, with regard to operation of SMRs. So, so who is going to be the operator? I mean, it's going to be the industrial guy who doesn't know nothing about nuclear. It's going to be the startup that is sending it 
but has not really operated anyone? Are they going to outsource it through an o and contract? I mean, there are so many different variety, but this is for one type of SMIs because then when you have the big ones where you have you know, companies that are used to op operating reactors and have been doing it for ages. So that's why each project is going to be different. The evacuation planning zone also. We have to see which type of SMR. I mean, I saw this uh, SMRs that they want to put in a parking lot. Okay, talk about evacuation planning zone there. Uh, authorities may determine that two or more in nuclear installations of one operator located on the same site shall be treated as a single nuclear installation. That's the conventions. Okay, so that also gives us the guidance. The other one which I find very interesting and that comes from the convention is that if damage is caused jointly by a nuclear incident or by another type of incident and it's not possible to reasonably separate the damage caused by each, all damage should be considered to be nuclear damage caused by the nuclear incident. Okay, put a reactor next to a chemical plant. That's it. Uh, there is also, <laughs> I mean, safety first. I'm sure there will never be, I mean, that's the thing. We're all part of the nuclear family. We know that's always safety first. No one wants to have an accident. These things will never be applied, but you have to take them into account and make them necessary in order to avoid that. One thing, and this is for the insurance sector. My God, you're gonna have so many reactors to cover. Be ready. <laughs> <laughs> so, number of reactors to be covered. And that's what I want to say. Thank you, everybody, for your... Uh, Dave Tucker is the Assistant Vice President of Research at McMaster University. Um, that's home to the McMaster Nuclear Reactor and one of the oldest, if not the oldest, contracts NIACS had, I believe, there. McMaster University, Colleen? Yeah. Um, Dave's responsible for the safe deployment of the university's entire suite of nuclear facilities, and uh, he returned to McMaster after a brief stint at the IEA. So he was there for about three and a half years, uh, where he was head of the Radiation Safety Technical Services. And uh, in between playing rugby and swimming with the whale sharks in the deep ocean waters off Cancun, as you can see from the slide there, <laughs> uh, Dave's amassed a respectable 34 years of experience in the nuclear industry and in a wide variety of areas through operations, research, medical isotope production, right? So uh, great uh, background. Um, please give Dave your undivided attention as he takes us through six decades of nuclear innovation at McMaster University. <laughs> Mike is yours, Dave. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today and to help you celebrate the 65th anniversary of the Nuclear Insur Insurance Association of Canada. Congratulations on that great landmark. The, the work you do enables our society to derive the benefits of nuclear technology in clean, reliable energy, in medicine, in nuclear research and materials research. So you will, as we uh, just started to cover at the end, continue to be vital as Canada looks to nuclear as a solution for climate change, as you predicted in 2018, apparently, Colleen. And uh, as mentioned, I understand I'm invited here today because we are the oldest and first uh, facility that's been continually covered by NIAC. So um, I guess that's both a badge of honor and uh, a caution for us, right? But uh, our facility is, is really 64 years young. And so I'm gonna tell you this afternoon a story of vision, uh, a story of triumph, a story of struggles, uh, and a story of a strong past and an exciting future. I'll tell you the story of the McMaster nuclear reactor, which is the most important research reactor that you've probably never heard of. And uh, that is a very common theme for us, that people have no idea we exist. <clears throat> I'm going to do it all without a single equation as well, which is a, it's a challenge for me. Uh, like, anyway. So quick background at McMaster University. We're a medium-sized, research-intensive university, just 80 kilometers up the road in, in West Hamilton. Uh, and as I mentioned, we constantly hear from our alumni that they had no idea there was a reactor here when, when they were going to school. We're, we're not hiding. There it is. It's pretty big. I'm not sure what people think it is. Uh, and we, uh, 
it's next to it. Yeah, yeah. And we do have a very active uh, public outreach program with about 2,000 visitors uh, per year. I just noticed there's no, there's no clock and I promised to make up some time. So better uh, keep going here. Um, a few, a little more background in McMaster University. We are one of the top 85 universities in the world. We're very, very proud of our reputation. Again, if you go around and talk to people about what they know about McMaster, lots of people will talk about our engineering school, lots of people will talk about our medical school. Uh, very few people will tell you that we are Canada's nuclear university. But that is a very important uh, part of our identity and, and our brand. And that the nuclear reactor at McMaster has been serving the Canadian uh, and world uh, since 1959. So it's been a big part of the, of the university. We're extremely proud of our world-class suite of nuclear facilities. Our reactor is the anchor. It's the reason everything else is there. The capability that grows up from running a research reactor uh, spills over and, and creates capacity to take on challenges that other universities wouldn't imagine. And now we have an extensive suite of hot cells. I'll talk about some of these a little bit uh, more. We have an accelerator, nuclear accelerator lab. We have a very large suite of high-level radioisotope labs engaged in medical isotope production and hosting uh, commercial manufacturing of radiopharmaceuticals. We have a cyclotron lab for work on cutting edge uh, nuclear medicine imaging agents and research. So we are uh, incredibly capable in nuclear research and innovation. And it's, there's a high barrier to entry. This incrementally uh, increasing capacity and capability you know, to, for a university now to get where we're at, it's about a billion dollars worth of physical and intangible assets. Now, no one's going to pay us a billion dollars for our 1959 reactor, we know that. But if someone wanted to get the capability we have now, it's a billion dollar uh, investment. <clears throat> so our history started in the very early days of the nuclear era, era with the visionary leadership of Dr. Harry Thode. Uh, he was really the grandfather of the nuclear program in McMaster and was a, a key researcher, uh, including in the Anglo-Canadian uh, contributions to the Manhattan Project. He built a very strong and world-recognized program, and one of the uh, results of that is the very first research, dedicated research building on the campus, which is building number nine, the ninth building built on our campus, was the nuclear research building. So I guess when we started focusing on nuclear research, people said, well, we ought to put that in its own building. So that is the building uh, now that's attached to our and adjacent to our research reactor. And by 1951, uh, there was pioneering work in the emerging field, new and emerging field of nuclear medicine uh, being done on our campus. So realizing the importance of nuclear, nuclear analysis and nuclear techniques uh, to the world and in the era of the Adams for Peace uh, speech and the, the start of the nuclear industry, uh, Dr. Thode realized we need a reactor on our campus. If we're going to be world class in this area, we need to get our own reactor. And especially he was thinking about the emergence of the uh, engineering school that was planned at that time. So our reactor predates our engineering school. So we embarked on a mission to get a research reactor for McMaster, which would ultimately become the first nuclear reactor on a university campus anywhere in the British Commonwealth. And here's something I think is just incredibly amazing. 1955, the decision was made to go out to build a reactor. 1956, it was funded. Now it was funded at those prices of those days, which was about two million bucks. It was pretty amazing too. By 1957, the building contract was awarded and construction started. By April 4th, 1959, four years from the decision to do this, our reactor was in operation. Four years from decision 
to blue glow in the core and neutrons for researchers. Unbelievable. And, you know, it, it troubles me a little bit that we've lost our way. Uh, I don't think we'll ever get to four years from decision to building a reactor, but we've got to get a lot closer to it as a society. So just for context, in 1947, uh, the NRX reactor had started up, so we were, you know, uh, 1959 versus 1947. The NRU reactor, the second big reactor at Chalk River, was 1959, so the same year that we started. And the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they got their reactor in 1958. So uh, it was really an exercise in positioning McMaster uh, in the world. I'll just show you some quick images of the construction as they went at that time. I think it was also fascinating. This was the first continuous pour concrete construction in Ontario. You don't build big things now without continuous pour concrete construction, but it was innov innovative at this time. So innovation started with the construction of our containment building. So it looks very uh, Cold War era and austere there, but uh, that's how the reactor looked when it was first built. Um, here's some images of the early days in the reactor, and I think this is uh, the 1959 equivalent of texting each other at dinner, right? <laughs> but uh, everything was clean and pristine. This is before we let the researchers in, I'm, I'm sure, because, uh, you know, it filled up with equipment very quickly. The old view of the control system, but I'll just say... It's not that different than today's view of the control system. Some of the components are actually original components and still run on vacuum tubes. We have 64 years of reliability data on those components and we're not in a big hurry to change them. The thing that's driving the update to solid state electronics is our inability to source vacuum tubes. So this gives you a, a picture of the reactor from the top, so-called experimental uh, floor, uh, down to the core is behind these beam ports, about five meters in. And this is the uh, beam port floor where people can access beams. And in the early days of the reactor, this was very much the focus of activity. Uh, people were doing sort of basic and uh, applied work in nuclear physics, supporting the growth of the uh, nuclear power field, and really doing some fundamental work. And it was an extremely busy, oversubscribed facility uh, from the very early days. I don't want to age myself, but I do want to note that Dr. Presswich and Dr. Kennett uh, were my supervisors for my senior undergraduate <laughs> thesis. So. Those are people that were in this reactor from the moment the blue glow started. Uh, it was a real privilege for me to be, to be taught by them. <clears throat> the application of the reactor started to evolve. Uh, the, the unknowns were getting filled in on fission product yields and things in the work really in nuclear physics shifted over to our big particle accelerator lab that came to the campus shortly after this. Why? Because we had the nuclear reactor, so the growth was, was spurned, uh, spurned. Growth was initiated from the presence of the reactor uh, even then. But the uh, next generation of work through the 60s and 70s focused on neutron scattering and developing the cutting edge techniques that are still cutting edge techniques today. Neutron facilities that enable neutron scattering to do material studies and the development of materials of the future are incredibly oversubscribed in the world. And we are currently um, building new facilities for that at our reactor. We built a new beam hall in 2017 on the east side. Now we're about to start digging for a new beam hall on the west side and we're putting a major uh, CFI funded uh, project in to be the Canadian home for neutron scattering since the shutdown of the NRU reactor. Very important, that's a picture of Dr. Bertram Brockhaus who won the Nobel Prize for his work developing this essential technique.
things began to shift still with uh, increasing use of the NRU reactor for neutron scattering. It really became uh, much of the center and applied uses started to dominate in our reactor through the 1970s. Using the reactor to create images, neutron radiography, and specialized analysis of samples where you expose them to neutrons, make them radioactive, or study the reaction that's going on to probe the constituents of that sample. Techniques that were used to analyze a lot of interesting things, mining samples from Briex, that's one of them, uh, yeah. Perhaps we're more proud of moon sample, moon rock samples, right? Were analyzed in our reactor using neutron activation analysis. And uh, the neutron radiography, still a very important application of the reactor today. We host a company called NRay that radiographs turbine blades for jet engines. It's every, uh, they're cast items. And if you don't make sure the cooling, the very fine cooling channels in those turbine blades are clear of the casting material, uh, and you put them in an engine, they will overheat. They can take out the engine and, and the plane. So the company that we host has about 95% of the North American domestic market. So if you've flown on a plane with an engine manufactured in North America, I think you probably all have, those blades were tested for safety at the McMaster nuclear reactor. So we're very proud also of that uh, contribution. Uh, medical isotopes have been an important theme for us since the very beginning. Uh, we started, as I mentioned, one of the very first research programs uh, in our new nuclear research building was on uh, nuclear medicine. Uh, one of the accomplishments we're most proud of most of us think about PET scanning these days as a pretty standard clinical uh, tool. I mean, it's specialized, but it's available uh, everywhere in the, in the Western world for sure. And uh, it was developed at one of the very first, we didn't invent the technique, one of the very first PET scanners was built at McMaster University. And it was built to enable a research program that tied together our reactor, our accelerator, our radioisotope labs and our clinical uh, staff to get things from the core to the clinic. So items, you know, to, to uh, produce novel imaging agents and get them all the way into patients for first in human trials. As a result, we had the uh, cover of Nature in the 1980s for the first activity imaging of the human brain. This uh, was a technique to track where dopamine was in the human brain. So, pretty exciting. Uh, today, we're still uh, a major global supplier of iodine-125. We produce about 60% of the world's supply. We're one of only two global scale suppliers. There's some local suppliers. We make enough uh, treat material for 70,000 patient treatments every year. Uh, so, medical isotopes is a very, very big deal for us. Uh, very quickly, one of the things that we did is uh, when NRU was in a prolonged shutdown, we became the center for production of MOLLE-99, which leads to Technetium-99, the world's most important uh, nuclear medicine radiopharmaceutical ingredient. So um, that's something we could do. We could do about 10% of what NRU could do, uh, which was enough uh, even when we looked at it again in the 90s to take care of the critical case load. Um, we, didn't, we didn't end up doing that. It was too complicated. Uh, we'll skip this. Okay, so tough times. This is the struggles part. I've <laughs> talked to you about the vision, some of the triumph, and um, this is the struggles. And in uh, 1990 on, we got severe funding cuts. The government cut off our operating funding. Uh, that was the last year this our reactor ever received operating funding until this year. <coughs> in uh, January of 94, there was an incident while, over, while fueling the reactor that led to an overpowering. So there was no fuel damage, there was no radioactivity release, but there was a clear violation of our safety protocols. 
And those things together uh, really led to a university decision to shut down the reactor. And for several years, the reactor faced imminent shutdown. And um, I think if the university had been more administratively efficient, the reactor would have been shut down. So it's fortunate <laughs> there was a little bit of momentum there. This is uh, not going to be public, right? <laughs> Uh, president uh, Peter George uh, became the president of the university. One of his very first substantive uh, decisions was to reverse that reactor shutdown and recognize the potential for self-sustaining commercial operations and continued impact to research and education. He said, we're going to give you a chance, get your business going, operate and this is uh, just shortly before this uh, shortly after this decision that I rejoined the university so in the first time in uh, 2006 the reactor uh, won the GS Hewitt award for being a world-class research teaching and commercial facility so a very rapid uh, turnaround that's part of the triumph part Okay, core to clinic, I think I've talked enough about that, but I do want to just mention, because of the reactor, we, the university, hosted the Center for Probe Development and Commercialization, which started with the $25 million uh, CSER grant uh, by Dr. John Valiant, uh, attracted over $125 million in funding over time, has led to the spin-out and creation of two big radiopharmaceutical companies in Hamilton, uh, Fusion Pharma and Adam V, uh, so uh, targeted alpha therapy company, developing medicine that is going to save people that can't be saved today, and very very uh, advanced in their uh, clinical trials. We are positioning Ontario uh, in Hamilton to be part of the 35 billion a year global radiopharmaceutical industry because of the reactor ultimately. <clears throat> uh, we continue to upgrade and in in, invest in the facilities, uh, building a new suite of hot cells that's critical to the maintenance of our partners like OPG's uh, reactors. Uh, material analysis is done there to ensure the aging uh, of components is understood. Uh, we've added a cyclotron facility as I mentioned earlier and we're continuing to invest in our isotope production activities and in our uh, in our research facilities. Today and tomorrow what are we working on now? It's never been more exciting to be part of the nuclear family at McMaster in a good way. Right? It can be exciting to be part of nuclear things in a bad way. It's exciting in a good way. Things are happening. I, people from McMaster will roll their eyes if they hear me say this, but the sun has come up on nuclear and it's shining very brightly on McMaster University. There's a tremendous potential and we're harnessing it. So in medical isotope production, we're continuing to increase our share of the global iodine market and having global impact on health. We've just launched a new uh, product. We're the exclusive North American supplier and a major supplier even in Europe despite the flights of Holmium-166. It's a new radioembolic therapy for liver cancer. Uh, we are integrate. we're about to launch our lutetium-177 uh, product this year and to enable that we're expanding the reactors operation back to 24 hours a day, seven days a week and we're increasing to our full rated power of five megawatts. So we're operating uh, at basically 300% of the output by the end of this year that we have been through our uh, previous self-sustaining uh, commercial operations. Uh, industrial applications I mentioned, NRAE, we're doing hundreds of thousands of service irradiations for sample analysis uh, across the world every year as well as supporting research including clean energy research and uh, Dave's going to talk to you next about small modular reactors. We have very active research programs uh, supporting small modular reactors. We continue to grow our public outreach. In fact, we just hired a dedicated outreach manager who's leading a team of nuclear ambassadors to take 
uh, nuclear education out into elementary and secondary schools. We host, that's a COVID touch number actually, that 18, we're often over 2,500 visitors a year who come into our reactor, stand on the experimental bridge and look at the operating reactor core and have nuclear uh, demystified and, and desensitized for them. We have active research uh, community that's growing. The university is investing in nuclear as a strategy, a strategic priority, and we're uh, recruiting faculty across the university that are using our suite of nuclear facilities, uh, including a major build out, as I mentioned, of our neutron beam scattering uh, scientific equipment. And we're launching uh, programs to make sure that we're building the workforce of the future that Canada needs. And this is a recent announcement that we're very proud of with uh, uh, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories and AECL, where uh, initially it's uh, a dozen, I believe, undergraduate students are working in our labs for the summer and having uh, nuclear experience at uh, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, part of their outreach, part of our uh, education program programs. <clears throat> I mentioned, uh, you know, that this is the first year in over 30 years that we've received operating money. So I'm very uh, proud. Yesterday, uh, Ontario uh, Minister of Colleges and Universities, Jill Dunlop, and Ontario Minister of Energy, Todd Smith, were at our campus to echo the announcement in the provincial budget of $6.8 million to help us uh, transform its one-time funding over three years there'll be a federal announcement also. And it's part of a $25 million uh, program to get ourselves up to this 24 hour a day, expand all our revenue streams and get back to self-sustaining over uh, approximately five years. So it's a hand up uh, to get us to a, a brighter world that will serve our entire research, medical isotope and education uh, communities. So more things than ever, and I'll just very quickly close on a preview of the most exciting project we have, uh, which is the next reactor that we're looking to build. So we're currently doing uh, an, a feasibility study. The initial uh, phase of that, the technical feasibility study, will be finished next month on uh, building a net zero community, uh, a net zero community that will be driven and powered by a micromodular reactor at its heart. And we are very much hoping we'll do that right on our campus. Uh, the idea is to say, if we're gonna see, realize the value of micro reactors for off-grid communities, we've gotta to get to community deployment. We've gotta get off giant nuclear sites with huge emergency planning zones and infrastructure. And we've gotta get those micro reactors into a community. We've got 64 years of operating a small reactor in the heart of a community. If we can't do it, who can do it? So we want to pave the path, break the trail for community deployment, and we want to show how they can be used as a transformative source of secure, abundant, uh, clean energy for our off-grid communities in, and industries, but especially communities in Canada, and show what the power of transformative the transformative power of abundant energy can do for these communities, demonstrating, for example, energy intensive technologies like water purification and treatment, desalination, year round greenhouses for food security. Uh, these, are, these are the values, the, the payback from small nuclear reactor that we want to show can be achieved and create a place that people who want to see this and see if it's right for them uh, from anywhere in the world can come to McMaster and see it. If we go fast enough, we will be first. Okay, and that's the story of the McMaster nuclear reactor. Thank you. All right, folks, our last guest today started his career at the top of the TD Tower and has rode himself, or curled himself, onto a number of varied and interesting roles using his movie star good looks to land a part in the movie Skulls until he came to his senses and took a job at OPG. Far more glamorous, but perhaps not as well compensated. <laughs> He's a recipient of the 2023 One OPG Innovation Game Changer Award for his 3D laser scanning work. In addition to his work with OPG, David also sits on the board of directors for Global First Power, 
providing insight and strategic direction in their bid to develop Canada's first high temperature gas micromodular reactor. His work with Global First Power along with his current position at OPG as the Director of Engineering for New Nuclear makes him particularly well suited to provide us with a unique perspective on the SMR landscape in Canada. Developments in this area were recently a hot topic at the Nuclear Engineers Forum in Prague and uh, we're fortunate to uh, hear an insider's perspective on these developments uh, from a man at the forefront of the charge in the Western world. Please join me in welcoming our very own gentleman burglar, Dave Tindall. And yes, I am limping because I actually ran a half marathon on Sunday and I'm, little, I'm dying. <laughs> so, no, it's okay. Does anyone know first aid? No, no. It's, <laughs> you shouldn't start the race on a shin splint and think it's going to get better. Uh, it doesn't. Um, so, so I really appreciate the, uh, the, the introduction and the opportunity to be here to talk to you today because it is a really exciting part, uh, time to be part of this industry. Um, it is growing. It is growing, it is changing, it is different, but a lot of it's the same. And that's kind of some of the interesting parts of this. And so, just fun fact, I actually went to McMaster, and I knew there was a reactor, Dave, so there you go. So <laughs> it ends up being that, you know, it's a small world, and that's why I said it. I knew it was right beside the engineers, and we kept them there in a small dark box. That's how we train engineers, right? So, um, but, that, but that's why we're good at it. So today, what is happening in Ontario? And I'm gonna give you a, a little bit more about not just what's happening in Ontario, and I'm happy to answer any questions, because OPG's vision is not just about Ontario. This is about electrifying a generation in a time. We start here. This is our home, this is our center, this is our core. But we grow, and the world is watching us. So that's the part about being a first mover, is everyone watches. So, so today it does start with our climate change plan. This is the goal of our company, right? So enabling, we have, we have goals as, a, as an organization, as a country. Our mission is to enable that. And, and it starts with electricity. Electricity becomes the core of all of our business. But when you look at just looking, uh, if you look just at electricity, that's not going to solve the issue. There are many other pieces of what um, a zero carbon economy looks like. So whether that's hydrogen, whether that is fuels, whether that is heating, as Dave talked about, how does that work? How do you do fuel, food production? Climate change isn't about just, uh, I'll call it electricity. It's not just about clean air. It's about enabling a new form of life uh, and sustaining life. So, so one of the questions that we always get is like, why nuclear, right? Why would you actually go after nuclear? Well, when we look at tradition, so we've grown over time, so 60 years of operation at McMaster, we've had Chalk River around for years, we've had Pickering, that, you know, was, that was a fun fact, that, that you know, the law came in in 1970 when the first Pickering reactor went critical in 1971, um, so the timing of it's always interesting. So we have a long storied history of commercial nuclear power in the province of Ontario. Um, we have not sat still. We have advanced the safety of our facilities. We have modified them. We have continued to design them. We had a massive growth plan as a company. So if you, one of the things that, you know, I've had the opportunity to go over the last little bit is the history of our company. And going back into the Ontario Hydro days and actually dusting off some of the plans, did anybody know that there was a four by 1250 megawatt can-do plant that was conceptually designed? Did anybody know we had done the research to build the equivalent of Darlington completely underground? Fun facts, these things are all gonna end up in Archives Ontario um, because it's all going to be lost history. But in that history, you see the future as well. And so when we talk about SMRs and everybody's like, hey, these things are bright and shiny and they're new, no, they're not. Almost every one of these technologies has existed, has operated, has operated somewhere in the world, has been uh, researched for years and decades. So these are not new technologies. They are not new. We are looking at new applications of technology. And so that's when everybody talks about innovation and what does innovation mean? Innovation just isn't about developing new technologies and yes, we want to do things differently and yes, we will do things safer than we've done them in the past, but that's not building on saying that something's unsafe. It's just that constant drive for being more and more safe. So advancements in safety, the climate change goals. So important, we need no, low or no carbon solutions. 
but we also will need ones that are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And not just about the reliability, because let's pretend you can get to large scale storage. Let's pretend you can get to mass amounts of renewables. On what land? On what water? On what surface of the planet? And so energy density becomes important, not just the fact that it's low carbon, it's energy density. So in terms of our climate change goals and enabling society, why wouldn't you put a small reactor at a place like McMaster? I can power a community. I can power a new form of research. I can power and enable new jobs. So these reactors, if we let's demonstrate it, we can put them in multiple locations. But there's a cost to multiple locations as well. So we have to think about what's the balance, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. There is a long-term growth in energy demand. No matter, it doesn't matter whether we agree. It's been a very slow and steady curve. And so do you need a large reactor today? No, if we built a large reactor today in the province of Ontario, we would be contributing to a surplus baseload generation that would cause problems. So we would crash, we would have a not, not a great price point in terms of economic advantage. Would we be helping carbon? Yeah, absolutely. We'd be helping carbon, but not in our own province. We'd be helping carbon in the surrounding jurisdictions of an intertide grid, which is actually a good thing. Don't get me wrong, climate change doesn't happen in one province. So people are saying, why would you do more nuclear in Ontario today? It isn't about today, and it isn't about just our province. It is about the country, it is about the community, it is about enabling a nuclear growth strategy here and in Canada. And so we can rely and we can wait for someone else to do it, but why wouldn't we go first and seize that opportunity? So when we talk about SMRs, uh, it's interesting, I was down at the uh, Nuclear Energy uh, Assembly in uh, Washington uh, a couple weeks ago, and one of the things they talked about is the worst word to use for new nuclear is SMR, and small modular reactors. So I'm actually, you know, and it's funny because when somebody asked me to name my department when I was establishing it a couple years ago, I, they're like, you should be SMR engineering. And I'm like, no, we are going to be new nuclear engineering. And so maybe I was a few years ahead of my branding time, but, but nevertheless, it is an important piece because I want to make sure what is small, what is modular. Everybody knows what a reactor is conceptually, but I can tell you that some SMRs are not small. I can tell you that some of them aren't modular. I can say that some of them are neither. <laughs> and I can say some of them are both. Um, so, so really, it's the very, very weird word to use. But nevertheless, when I was asked to talk about SMRs, um, it really comes down to what are they and why are they here. And so we talk about uh, SMRs as being new, and, and uh, as I said, they're not. Uh, they're still fission-based. Um, they use uranium, mostly. Uh, that's what their goal is. They are low enriched, typically. There are some that are naturally uh, natural uranium, but not well developed. Um, most of them are low. Some of them are using HALU. High assay, low enriched. So what that is, is up to between t basically between 10 and 20% enrichment. Anything above 20, that's going to be high, high enriched. So that's not going to be a commercially available product. So anything you're hearing about today in SMR space, uh, minus a couple that are kind of going through some US DOE type stuff, uh, will be using less than 20% enrichment. So it's just kind of level set on the fuel forms. You've got natural fuel. Low enriched, which is less than five. Low enriched plus, as they're calling it, which is up to 10. And then high assay, low enriched uranium, which is up to, to 20. Um, and so these are all different pieces of what they are. But has, has enriched fuel exist? Enriched fuel has exist, uh, existed for years. It has existed in Canada. It has been handled in Canada. It is transported through Canada. So let's not pretend that it doesn't exist. It does, it has, and it will continue to exist in our country for various forms. So this is kind of a myth-busting exercise that people don't believe that we have enriched uranium in Canada. We have. We just don't enrich it ourselves, typically, at least not outside of a reactor. Um, we don't enrich it ourselves, and we don't um, 
uh, use it for anything but the purposes of power generation and medical isotope generation. That's really the only purposes we have for, um, for our, our nuclear uses and medicine, of course. But now we look at it and say, okay, what else can you use? What, what do we use fission for? We use fission just to generate heat. We've traditionally used it to generate heat uh, or, or neutron beams, but let's say for the purposes of today, industrial, we create heat. We boil water, we spin a turbine. That's as simple as it's been. Now, do you need to spin a turbine? You don't need to spin a turbine. Yes, I need a way to dissipate heat. Well, how can I do that? I could put it into water, and I could pipe hot water through area, uh, areas. I could use it to break water down into its individual elements for various forms. Uh, I can do lots of stuff with heat. There are lots of processes. Steel mills, for example. People think, OK, well, what does a nuclear reactor do with steel? They have a lot of turbine-driven equipment that just happens to use steam that is run at 400 degrees. Well, a reactor today, if it's a light water reactor or a heavy water reactor, can only produce heat and steam at about 300 degrees. And so you start looking at other reactor technologies. Other reactor technologies and some of these small reactor technologies get much hotter. So content, you know, conceptually, for example, a high temperature gas reactor can get to like 900 degrees Celsius. So that enables and opens up a much broader set of market uses for what are we using the heat for. So it is the same technology. Um, it's just different applications. So, so what are they? And we talk about the benefits, and I'll you know, call, call it this is a bit more of the marketing slide, if you will. But you know, they are smaller from a footprint perspective. We can put them into smaller locations. You can do it from a growth perspective if you need smaller tranches. Uh, for example, many, for example, mining communities, uh, they will start off in needing one, and then they will build, and then they may put on a processing factory, and they may need another one and another one. So having three or four or five may make sense as opposed to just needing to build one big one or having large uh, transmission projects and scaling. So it allows them to... Uh, I'll call it adapt to the conditions of the mine. So that's one of the things that we talk about from a, from a footprint perspective. Um, everything is focused on safety, nuclear. We talked about that earlier, that the industry is focused on safety. Um, that has been no, uh, I'll call it, uh, different in the development of SMRs. Why are people doing what they're doing? Why are they choosing the, the technologies they are? Um, readiness. Uh, and you know we'll talk a little bit about where we're going at OPG um, and, and proving these things. And so this is the one thing that I think is always interesting for when you think about ensuring these things. Well, do you believe in the safety and how do you demonstrate that and how do you get the regulatory efficiency? Do the regulators believe it? And so these are all questions that are being answered right now in these technologies. But rewind a little bit. So if we think about the technologies that are out there, you've probably heard of high temperature gas reactors. There, has been, there have been multiple in the US. There was multiple in Germany. Uh, there is one operational in China. And there is one operational in Japan. So they exist. There are frameworks. Uh, sodium fast reactors. So you know, the, France had, had a couple. Uh, the Russians have a few. The Chinese are working on them. Um, there has been uh, multiple in the US as, at demonstration scale. Um, so molten salt reactors. Uh, when was the first molten salt and why was it reactor, why was it built? It was designed to be an airplane engine, believe it or not. The molten salt reactor experiment was actually designed to be an air, aircraft engine for the purposes and was obsoleted by the intercontinental ballistic missile. That is why molten salt reactors were starting to be developed. And so dusting off these, the research, the development, and looking at those safety characteristics is why you're seeing SMRs come back. Um, in this. We also look at, you know, how do they are fueled? So it's different cycles in each one of these technologies. And so I was very, I'll call it, uh, happy to hear that, you know, the way that the community, the legal frameworks, it has to be based on technology. You can't paintbrush uh, the size of a reactor. It is very technology dependent, and they all have different characteristics. Um, so that's really, really important. Um, but they are different. And so when we talk about the heat differences, when we talk about the off-grid versus on-grid, when we talk about um, the project schedule and construction schedules, I am convinced that after we get through the first, the first of a kinds, 
you can get some of these reactors into a spot where they are from the time you decide to go in, they are less than three years, provided we can get through the environmental framework. That is right now your gator. So on micro reactors, uh, the, re the, 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 uh, the environmental policy today is, is fairly, I'll call it straightforward, well known, it's practiced. Uh, on anything, uh, call it uh, anything larger than 200 megawatts thermal, uh, we're gonna be testing it for the first time, uh, not at Darlington. Uh, Darlington is under the old regime, but the future projects that we'll talk about uh, will all be under, and the Saskatchewan project as an example, will be all under a new framework, and that's under the Impact Assessment Act of Canada. So that has not been tested in nuclear space. So that's something that'll be new. So we've already talked about this and where they are and who and who they are. So we've got you know salt and sodium and metal cooled. There's you know lead reactors. There's all kinds of different reactors that are out there that all fall under that concept of of uh, of SMRs. Um, you know Canada did did Canada ever look at an SMR? Can do, can do three. Kandu 3 was looked at for the deployment in Saskatchewan a number of years ago in the 80s and 90s and was developed and is effectively a, a small version of a CANDU. So they do exist. So boiling water reactors, I won't bore you with this, but it is a very direct cycle, right? It's fuel in water, water to steam, steam to turbine, and uh, turbine condensed back out and recycled through the core over and over and over again. Simplest, probably one of the simplest designs of reactor that you can, you can, uh, you can have. Um, so this is what the, I'll call it the first a small modular reactor in Ontario will effectively look like, and that's in the GE uh, BWRX 300 design. So this is what that plant looks like. And so from a size perspective, if you look at the pitch of a soccer field, you can effectively put the whole plant inside of that pitch, just to kind of give you a concept of the size. Now, that is small, but I talked about density earlier, and even doesn't matter which technology I pick, they're all reasonably, say, three quarters to a football field in size for about 300 megawatts. I can only put about four of these in the same space as Darlington exists, which produces 3,600 megawatts. So when you start thinking about energy density, um, these are slightly less energy dense, but it is intentional. It is intentional for uh, safety, it's intentional for core design, it's intentional to bring down the land, the emergency planning zones, so it is a, it is a trade-off that you get. You are sacrificing some of your density for all of the other things we need to enable them to be used um, in Ontario and in Canada. So just to give you a kind of a, a briefing of what this looks like, that is a deeply embedded structure. So when we talk about the things that we talked about from a, a safety and a security and an emergency preparedness point of view, uh, from uh, you know, the hazards that, for example, airplane crashes and things like that, minimizing threat vectors for security, putting a reactor deeper in the ground minimizes the, uh, the consequences and the risk in that way. So these are all intentional design choices that you're doing, so security by design, resiliency by design, that's in this. And those passive safety features, if you look right at ground level, millions of liters of water that are there to passively cool this reactor. So seven days where the human does nothing, a minimum of seven days where the human does nothing, and it can stay cool and contained inside that place. Simple action, put up a fire truck, pump up the hoses, and fill that tank back up. So that's the kind of simplicity that we're looking for uh, in these designs. I won't bore you with the technical, so just so you know where we are. So we have submitted our license to construct. It's going under, going at sufficiency reviews. We're in active communication with the regulator. Uh, we've got our contract uh, uh, partnership announced and issued. Uh, so right now we are preparing for our hearings. Our hearings will be scheduled. The first set happens uh, towards uh, in January and then uh, the rest of next year. And that gives us a couple years to get our license to construct issues while we prepare our site. So we're currently moving dirt, leveling our lands, building our fences, building in, bringing in all the construction services. All of that work is being done now uh, in order to, as soon as we have that license to construct, we can start nuclear construction. 
that is what our goal is in 2024, nominally a 36 to 40 month schedule on the first unit to, to provide construction, be in service uh, late 28, early 29 commercially. So that is what we are pushing forward with at Darlington today. And I think you'll see right now what we're doing. It's a single unit build with the infrastructure to support up to four units. So when we thought about building the cooling water intake, when we thought about building the switch yard, we aren't building it for one unit or uh, not uh, expandable. It is an expandable set. The water cooling, you can only dig that tunnel once. Really hard to enlarge a tunnel underneath the lake. Um, but deep water cooling is a very effective way to cool our power plants and we're blessed with sites that are on these lakes uh, and leveraging that uh, today. So just refreshing and level setting back to it. We talked about the, the light water cooled. Why would you go there first? The answer is it's the most ready technology from a regulatory perspective, from a well-known, well-understood, the materials don't need research. There's innovation in it, don't get me wrong. There are things that need to be tested. There are new components. There are some unique design features, but all things that are very well understood and, and I'll call it in the grand scheme of things, easier to demonstrate. This is still a big lift and we have a huge team working on this, but it's easier than some of the other, uh, I'll call it more advanced technologies from a convincing and understanding and longevity perspective uh, in terms of the documentation. So we talk about the non-water-cooled reactors. So it's still doing the same thing, but it's using higher enriched fuel typically. That's not available today, at least domestically. So the only source of fuel today to get into that highly enriched uranium at a commercial scale is Russia. Guess where we're not buying fuel from? So the reality is, is if you looked at, if you track the industry, the advanced reactor demonstration projects in the US, both of those projects have seen delay and publicly stated delays of nominally 18 to 24 months as a result of the availability of the high assay, low enriched uranium fuel. And that's why I highlighted it earlier is, okay, we have to move, we have to move now. We can't wait for these things. So many of the, the reactors, especially in the micro reactor space, can actually be flexible. They can use anything from say 10 to 20% and that just changes, you know, kind of, I'll call it, changes the horsepower and changes the longevity of what your, uh, what your car is, if you want to use, or of your reactor, if you want to use a car analogy to it. Um, but, they, uh, but these reactors have run before, right? So they have run um, and there's a lot of lessons learned. So, you know, whether that you, you use the leverage, the, the, you leverage the experience that, for example, the French had with the Phoenix and the Super Phoenix reactors and some of the challenges they had there, these reactor designers are leveraging all of those lessons learned and putting them into their new design so that they really are focused on uh, taking the historical knowledge and applying it as we move forward. You've got high temperature gas cooled reactors now. Okay, same thing, most are using either LEU plus, that 10% enrichment, uh, up to about the, the HALU at, at 19.75. Uh, they have refueling varied in duration. Some of them are continuously fueled. So I realize it says here approximately 20 years. Some of them are full core loads that you can set and forget if you really kind of want to use the, uh, the simplicity but if you look at some of them, like X Energy's design uh, at, the, at the grid scale, that's a constantly fueled reactor. You are constantly cycling the fuel through and, and refueling uh, pebbles on a day, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, it's a gas, we know, we've, we've used gas cooling. Gas coolant is not anything new. We've driven turbines with high temperature gases, whether it was CO2 or helium. So these, again, a little bit more challenging in terms of the nuclear piping and nuclear materials because you start to run cores a lot higher temperature, the aging and degradation mechanisms not necessarily um, as a huge, they don't have huge operational experience. Experimental base is there uh, and it's trying to convince uh, the, util the, the uh, developers to work together and trying to coalesce on certain materials otherwise the aging and the aging management and the things that we look at from a longer term perspective get more and more complicated. So 
Um, we have a partnership uh, right now to investigate the, the basically the potential for deploying the XE100, the X Energy design at a, at, a, at a larger scale. So this is nominally, we'd be looking at a four pack of these uh, reactors. So uh, each one of them produces about 200 megawatts thermal. And I say thermal because it's about 80 megawatts electrical. Um, but that thermal energy uh, is really what we're interested in. So if I'm going to do uh, just a reactor that generates power, I've got my GE design and I'm going to build that. But if I'm going to look at a design that needs to produce both high temperature heat as well as electricity or just heat, this is a technology that we can deploy uh, and we're really investigating them for industrial co-location is really what our, our end desire here is because it is a massive part of the sector. So when you start thinking about industrial co-location, siting reviews, the hazards, internal and external hazards, if you treat each other as a black box and how do you integrate, those are the things that we're working through right now in building those. I think we talked earlier about non-traditional operational models. Well, why are we here? We're interested in being an operator. Will we necessarily be the full owner? No. We will not necessarily be the full owner. But we are bringing and using and leveraging our talents as an operator that has operated continuously since just before 1971, effectively, uh, it, at, in, in southern Ontario. I mean, we had the Bruce. We had Douglas Point that operated before then. Um, and so we have a long and storied history of safe nuclear operations. But to Dave's point, d did we always have... Um, you know, did we have any trials or tribulations? Yes, we've had those. We've taken those lessons learned, and it's about deploying our culture. So one of the things that I know concerns people about the a lot of the micro companies or these companies that are out there advertising, you know, whether it be us or X Energy, doesn't matter. How do these companies become credible uh, operating companies or standalone op operating companies? By partnering with experienced utilities that we can bring that culture. So that's what our mission is. So are we, um, you know, we are looking at this, but we are not just isolated to X Energy. We're interested in helping any uh, advanced reactor technology developer in their operations and being an operational partner because we bring that experience to it. So when we think about um, the next set of reactors, so so we talked about okay, we went grid scale and where we're going with the kind of the energy production. Then we went to more of those industrial reactors, and now it's micro reactors. And so so Dave talked about putting a micro reactor at uh, McMaster uh, as an enabler. Uh, we've got our first uh, demonstration project up at Chalk River and, and doing the commercial demonstration unit there. And so remote mining, remote communities. Uh, remote communities is, uh, for us, probably the number one priority. And as Dave talked about, why would you look at it and what do they need? Uh, power, uh, electricity is great, uh, but they need heat. Uh, heat from uh, growing food. Um, is huge. So greenhouses, desalinization, providing water. And so changing somebody's way of life, uh, it was interesting hearing some of the communities talk and saying that, you know, it was a 15 year old, um, 15 year old girl and she had never heard um, silence other than when the diesel generator shuts off for maintenance. And then they don't have power. And so just the constant drone of a diesel generator that's a concept I've never had to live with. And so it's hard to understand what that looks like um, and generally, generally, nuclear reactors are pretty quiet. Um, outside the building, at least. Inside, they can be pretty loud. But outside the building, they're, they're pretty quiet machines, pretty innocuous. Most people don't know McMaster has a reactor because they've walked by it and they've never heard it. So the reality is, is it makes no noise. Um, and, so the, and so, you know, just imagine the freedom. Imagine if you didn't have somebody banging, uh, you know, banging the, the diesel engine beside you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Imagine what just mental clarity that may give you. So this isn't just about, um, this isn't just about providing power. It's about providing an increased quality of life um, and using nuclear to do that. And so, so we see micro reactors anywhere from about half a megawatt. Um, up to about 10 to 20 to 30, uh, and that's in the electric, that's, I'll call it electric, so I'm not using the heat, uh, I kind of changed my units there a little bit on you, but um, they, they do end up in about that space. Some of them are being looked at to be, you know, transportable. There are reactor developers today that want to put a reactor in the C-130 and be able to drop it, uh, drop it on an airplane and be able to use it for disaster relief. 
Uh, there are solutions that are providing uh, what they call a transportable nuclear power plant frameworks. So technology agnostic, but a basically a transportable site. And so whether it's any one of these types of microreactors could be placed inside that facility and then moved to a location. So there are new and novel approaches being considered, and I think this team in here will be a very important part of enabling that. So part of my challenge here today is getting informed, and that's why you're here, and that's why I'm here, I think, is to help you get informed, but also to start thinking about it. And if you have questions, ask us. Maybe we know the answer, or maybe we haven't thought about it yet. And guess what? We need to think about it, because when we come and say, yeah, we need insurance for the scene, you're like, yeah, right. Um, that's going to be a bit of a problem for us, right? So, so what I always, that's one, one of the things when we talk about business development, we need to bring that total package as, a, as, a, as an operator, as a utility to the team. So this is, uh, I'll call it an early rendering of what the, the MMR looks like. It, you know, it, it's still in design, so it changes a little bit. But when you think about what this looks like, um, it is small. Like 50 transport trucks total. That's the whole plant uh, in modules. So standard ISO shipping containers put together, built in a factory, moved to site, uh, and assembled. So that's where we are today. We've got the license to prepare site, uh, environmental site, site uh, work underway. We're in our submissions, um, and so it's exciting with the with the goal of being online uh, in 27. So, so what is the kind of the market look like? And that's where I'll maybe I'll kind of it'll be one of the things is is this isn't just about power. It's not just about those remote communities. There are a massive number of end use locations, and and we talk about um, you know the various provinces. Four provinces have signed on to an MOU. You've got Alberta, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and Ontario that have signed to work together on a pan-Canadian approach to deployment. Doesn't mean the same technologies necessarily, but it means enabling and working together to advance those common threads and issues. So we look at and we are expanding in, in Ontario, uh, in Saskatchewan. Uh, in, you know, we talk with a lot of people in Alberta about what did they need and what they are enabling. So these are all markets that are growing. And so, you know, it's, it, it is good to see this is just the national market. The international market is even more uh, broad and different. Um, and so what I'll leave you with is that we, I was asked to talk about small, but I'll say that large comes back on the table, okay? So large comes back on the table as part of a discussion point. When I, talk, when I mentioned earlier about land use and density, some of the benefits of those centralized sites, there are some benefits to having centralized sites, but Ontario is kind of one of the most interesting provinces to try and power. It is huge. What other place can you drive for 24 hours and not have left the province? Let alone, let alone, I'm just talking a straight shot. Um, so, so, you know, you would be what, across seven countries in Europe in, you know, easily, like easily uh, in less than that? So you start thinking about it and you kind of go, where's our population density? 80 to 90 percent of our population density lives in southern Ontario. So can I build a large reactor in northern Ontario and have it make sense? Probably not. Can I build a small reactor in northern Ontario? Can I build micro reactors in the far north of Ontario? And what can they be used for? So you start thinking about, and what are they used in conjunction with? So we love renewables. We love hydro. We will continue to deploy those. We will continue to work with them. We believe in energy storage. We are not a company that says nuclear is the solution and the only solution. It is part of the solution, thank you, we, we agree. We might have been a little slow on the uptake. It wasn't 20, 2008 when we, when we started, but I will tell you, we've been looking at new nuclear, we've had a team looking at new nuclear since about 2014. It started with one, it went to two, now we're about 100 within our company that are looking at new nuclear deployment, and it's like a hockey stick of inflection when you start looking at what this will look like to deploy. So we expect to be uh, the large nuclear to be part of the story, but we also believe that SMRs are, play a very vital role. So it is not just about large. We need reactors of different shapes, of different sizes, of different technologies to enable all of the things that nuclear can bring. We need that high t the various heat loads. We need the electricity. We need the isotopes. 
we need the ability to deliver them in trucks. We need them to be delivered on boats and we need them to be built here. And so that's really what we believe in and it goes to the world. So there's our mission, electrifying life one generation at a time, uh, or electrifying life in one generation, sorry, one generation at a time, there you go. Um, that was the old one, it was like a hybrid. Um, so electrifying life in one generation um, is, is what our new kind of mentality as a company is. And so that means all forms of energy, it means bringing people uh, power. And so with that, uh, that was the end of my presentation for today, but I have lots of additional material. I'm, we'll stick around for questions uh, and be able to, to answer what I can and talk. Um, but there are challenges out there. This is not gonna be easy. But if it was easy, everybody would do it. And so the reality of it is, is that's why we go first. We're experienced. Our refurbishment projects have given us the confidence. It's given our board the confidence. It's given our shareholders. It's given the government confidence to invest in deploying new nuclear with Ontario and that supply chain benefit that we can get out and being uh, and embracing nuclear as part of this solution. So it's exciting times to be here and I thank you for today. <laughs>